there were some considerations about an infinite past that were used in the 6th century AD by one of my fa favorite philosophers, a Greek philosopher. We don't have to worry about names. His name was Philoponus. Philoponus means workaholic. Uh, well, a Philoponus, the workaholic, <clears throat> he was a Christian, and so he took the very unusual Christian view that the universe had a beginning. I say that's very unusual. Indian philosophy doesn't believe the universe had a beginning. Pagan Greek philosophy didn't believe the universe had a beginning. Perhaps this cycle of the universe could have a beginning. Yes, lots of people believe that. But the Christian idea that it had an absolute beginning and there was nothing there until it began, that's a pretty unusual view. Now, Philoponus was both a Platonist, but unlike most Platonists, he was a Christian in the 6th century. And he used the argument that Christianity must be right, the universe had a beginning, because otherwise you'd have had an infinite past. Well, what's wrong with an infinite past? Ah, well, infinity is rather a frightening concept. And Aristotle had taken the fright out of infinity by a very clever account of what it was, an account which is still taught in almost all schools today. School teachers tend to avoid frightening their pupils by saying, look, when I say infinity, I'm not talking about a more than finite number. Let's forget about that. I'm just talking about getting as close as you like or <clears throat> um, approaching a limit. Approaching a limit just involves a very large finite number of steps and that seems safer than a more than finite number. And this tradition starts with Aristotle in the 4th century BC. He said, look, we'd have horrible puzzles if we talk about infinity in the sense of a more than finite number. The puzzle that worried him most was this. Take the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's an infinity of them in some sense of infinity. And take the even numbers just. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. There's an infinity of those. And yet, surely, the even numbers are only half of, of the totality of numbers. How, if one is only half the other, can they both be infinity asked? So to avoid that, he said, let's think of infinity a different way. Not as a more than finite number of anything, but as an ever-expandable finitude, an ever-expandable finite number. That's just what school teachers are saying now when they talk of approaching a limit. As large a finite number of steps as you like, but finite, always finite. Well, that's very safe, and it fits very well with the future. Think of the future instead of the past for a moment. Surely the future years, if you start from now, are going to be infinite, if at all, only in Aristotle's safe sense. If you have a starting year now, in 2003, You'll never have a, a more than finite number of years after now. You'll only have Aristotle's ever-expandable finite number. One day, if things go on indefinitely, there'll be a million, then there'll be a billion, then there'll be a billion plus one. Any number you like to name, eventually, if things go on, there'll be a higher finite number of future years after 2003. But that doesn't mean we'll ever reach a more than finite number. Aristotle's account of infinity seems perfect for future years. But it's quite wrong for past years, isn't it? Because if the universe had no beginning, the universe will already finish going through a more than finite number, surely. So the infinity of past years doesn't seem to fit the unfrightening account given by Aristotle and modern school teachers. It really does look like a more than finite number if the universe had no beginning. Perhaps this could be used as an objection. Um, 
against a beginningless past. Perhaps you could argue, since there's only going to be an expandable finitude of years in the future, surely we should expect no more than an expandable finitude of years in the past. Why should the past be different from the future? Surely we should expect a finitude in the past too. No. The answer to that is this. There's a reason why the future is different from the past here. Because when I thought about the future years, I took a starting year, 2003. I could have taken any year, actually. It didn't matter which I took as the starting year. I could have taken 1066 or any year I liked. I'd get the same result that if you've got a starting year, then there will never come a time when you can say, ah, oh, now I've managed to fit in a more than finite number of years since the starting year. But of course, those people who think there's a beginningless history for the universe don't postulate a starting year. That's precisely what they're denying. And if you don't postulate a starting year, there's been ample time to fit in a more than finite number of years before now. So there's a good reason why a more than finite number is possible for the years before 2003, because there's no starting year, but not for the years after 2003, because you've imposed a starting year. One shouldn't think that if somebody speaks of an infinite past with no beginning, that they're saying that there's some year, or perhaps even lots and lots of years, that are separated by an infinite distance from now. That's not what's meant. When one talks of an infinite collection of years, the infinity, the more than finiteness of those past years, is not a property of some one year or even of any of the individual years. It's a property of the collection as a whole. So you can't say, but it's absurd to say that the some year or several years or many years that are separated from now by an infinite gap, because that isn't what these people were saying who postulated the beginningless universe. No, the more than finite number of past years that they were talking about belongs to the collection of years as a whole. It doesn't belong to any of the individual years. It has been objected that there can't have been a more than finite number of past years because one couldn't count a finite number. It's true one couldn't, by any ordinary techniques, count a finite number, but that's once again because the whole process of counting involves taking a first starting number. So if you take a first starting number for your counting, you're not going to be able to fit in a more than finite number <coughs> of things you count uh, before you finish your counting. But although counting involves taking a starting number, the, it's a quite different task for the universe simply to pass through a more than finite number of years. Passing through a more than finite number of years does not involve taking a starting year. Precisely not. And so the objection to finishing an infinite count isn't an objection to finishing an infinite passing through. Now let me give you a last excruciating attack on the idea of a beginningless past before I return to Philoponus. I've not told any of uh, the groups of the present arguments I'm giving you now about um, infinite counts and so on, and I haven't told you um, the problem of Hilbert Sattel. Some people have said that if you could have a more than finite number of anything, then you could have an imaginary atel, not of course a real atel, but an imaginary atel with a more than finite number of rooms. But now, these people say, we can show that that's ridiculous. There couldn't be an atel with a more than finite number of rooms, because imagine, supposing that there was such an atel and every room was full. Now along comes a latecomer and he says, look, I'm sorry I'm late he says to the manager, but could you fit me in? And then the manager, if there was a more than finite number of rooms, would be able to say, certainly I can fit you in. 
In a very loud voice, all he'd need to say would be, would the occupant of room number one move into room number two? Would the occupant of room number two move into room number three? Etc. And then he'd say, I've made room for you in room number one. Now you may think there's something wrong here. You may feel that at the far end of the hotel, some unfortunate resident is going to drop off into outer space. But you needn't worry, because there is no farther end of this hotel. Because there's a more than finite number of rooms, there's one end of the hotel, room number one, but there's no far end. And so there's no place where anybody could drop off into outer space. There's no end. And so, this idea that one could accommodate the late comer, which was supposed to be absolutely absurd, is actually no more than the plain and simple truth. It's not an absurdity, it's a truth. In an hotel with a more than finite number of rooms, one could fit in the late comer. Now, coming back to my last, my last point, which is what was said about this by Philoponus in the 6th century. Coming back to that, I hope this will become a little bit plainer with my last example. Now, Philoponus, though he wasn't terribly well known 10 years ago, I think he was a very, very clever philosopher. And on behalf of Christianity, he said, look, all you pagan Greeks have agreed with Aristotle's non-frightening account of infinity as just an expandable finite number. And you've agreed with his view that one can't finish going right through a more than finite number. So you pagan Greeks must agree with Christianity that the universe can't have finished going right through a more than finite number of years. And there's something else. If the universe had finished going right through a more than finite number of years by this year, how many years would it have finished going right through by next year? Infinity plus one. But surely, um, Aristotle himself said, you can't have some infinities larger than others. Um, things can't be of different sizes because they contain an extra one year and yet both equally infinite. They can't be equal and yet one's got one more than the other. He thought that that was an absurdity. Well, you pagans, you're in that absurdity. Because if you think the universe, as you all do, had no beginning, you've got to say that by this year it's finished going right through a more than finite number of years, and next year it will be Infinity plus one, a more than finite number plus one. So you're in what you agree to be an absurd position. Now, I don't know whether any Greeks um, really understood how to get out of that problem about some infinities being larger than others. There is a single page written by the great mathematician Archimedes, which is being studied under ultraviolet light at the moment, very, very difficult to read, and it seems to be mentioning different sizes of infinity. That's one possibility. But otherwise, I think it was Islamic medieval philosophy after the end of the Greek period that I'm talking about, which was fully aware in the ninth century of the sense in which um, <clears throat> the even numbers are fewer than the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and the sense in which they're not fewer. Um, an, Arab, uh, uh, an Islamic philosopher called um, Ibn um, Tabit, Kura, seems to have understood this in the ninth century. An English philosopher called Grosstest seems to understand that this is true. In the 13th century, um, he was the Chancellor of Oxford University and Bishop of Lincoln. And I'm assuming he must have had a Latin translation of Islamic philosophy available to him or Islamic mathematics. Uh, because, he, as, as I say, it was probably not known to the Greeks. It was fully understood in the 14th century by Latin 
writing philosophers, including another English philosopher, not otherwise well known, called William of Annick. And he explained it in the following way. It is possible for the years up to 2003 and the years up to 2004 to be both equally more than finite and yet in a certain restricted sense one larger than the other. It's the difference between beyond and besides, said William of Annick in the 14th century. Now, imagine. Imagine that the years up to 2003 stretch out in an unending column from your right eye. Now imagine that the apparently larger number of years up to 2004 are stretching out in an unending column from your left eye into the distance. And imagine that the years are matched in pairs, 2003 against 2004, and so on, so that they're matched in pairs. If you can imagine these two columns of years stretching infinitely into the distance, I can now explain the difference between beyond and besides. One column has all the same years as the other column, plus one besides, because it's got 2004 in addition. It's got one extra year. So if you like to call that larger, you can call it larger in the restricted sense of having all the same years in it, plus one year besides. In that restricted sense, it would be larger. In a different sense, however, it would not be larger. It would not be larger in the sense that one column would stick out beyond the far end of the other. It would not stick out beyond the far end of the other, because neither column has a far end. It's rather like Hilbert's hotel, actually, in which the residents don't stick out beyond the far end of the hotel. Since it doesn't stick out beyond the far end of the other, in that sense, it's not larger. That, I think, was the clearest explanation of how you can have one infinity in a restricted sense larger than another, while at the same time, in a different sense, the beyond sense, it's not larger. That was a very clear explanation, but it took, it took an extra 700 years after Philoponus before in the 14th century, um, people were able to explain that. <clears throat> so the net result is, I think, that these very startling facts about infinity, um, that things can be both equally infinite even though one's got an extra member, Though they're very startling, they are absolutely true. And perhaps we can begin to understand them better when it's explained in this way in terms of besides versus beyond. They're startling, but they are true. And we shouldn't think that they show the whole idea of a more than finite number is absurd. 